the world is a delicate ecosystem, and here at Young Living, we are in a constant quest to give back and support the Earth in the best way possible. That means finding every opportunity to learn and be good stewards of the land. Bees are crucial to plants, and people want to save the bees. So let's pause and learn about the bees. Hello and welcome to Young Living's podcast, The Wild Drop. My name is Jacob Young, your host. Young Living is the world leader in producing and distributing premium essential oils. And this podcast will provide you with drops of information about Young Living, including stories, history, products, lots of little fun facts, and even more. In studio today is Dr. Joseph Wilson. He's an entomologist at Utah State University and founder of the Native Pollinator Project. Dr. Wilson, welcome to the show. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Awesome. So let's start. What is your official title? What do you do and why do you do what you do? That's a good question. So first, I am uh, Dr. Joseph Wilson is my official title. I'm a biology professor at Utah State University, also a founder of Native Pollinator Project. Um, I study bees mostly. Bees and wasps is is the broad kind of focus of my research. I, I really like bees though. Uh, native bees are my passion. So there's there's I categorize bees into two categories: mm-hmm. honey bees and then native bees. Honey bees are kind of an agricultural commodity. Uh, the pilgrims brought them over to North America. I focus on the other bees. Okay, sweet. Why bee specifically? So here's the the long version of the story. Uh, <laughs> I, I I always was into insects. I was mm-hmm. into wildlife in general. I loved nature shows on PBS when I was little. You know, even in second grade, that's what I would watch. You know, lions chasing gazelles and things like that. I grew up in Provo, Utah, and there's not a lot of lions chasing gazelles in my <laughs> suburban backyard. But I w- really wanted to see nature and experience nature. So in my backyard, there were some birds, but there was a lot of insects. And so I realized by learning about insects and and observing them, you know, I can turn over a log and see the equivalent of a lion chasing a gazelle mm-hmm. among the insects and spiders and other creatures out there. So I kind of fell in love with insects as in elementary school. Uh, then fast forward to the starting of college, I met this girl who was super cool, super attractive, and she just got back from a summer studying bees in Southern Utah. And so I started to pursue her, <laughs> and uh, she got me a job studying bees in the USDA Bee Biology Lab. And so then I got to go to Southern Utah and study bees also. Uh, she's now my wife, uh, co-founder of Native Pollinator Project. So we have been studying bees together for 20 years. Wow. Yeah. The stars just aligned yeah, for you. totally I did. love it. That's awesome. <laughs> and so I guess with recent events, and uh, as you're obviously very familiar and aware with is this Save the Bees um, movement that's going on right now. And you and I have kind of talked off camera before in the past of how this Save the Bees, you know, movement is technically in a way incorrect in, in, in some ways, in some format. And I'd just like you to share why in, in some ways it's not necessarily the correct movement. Yeah. And I, it's, uh, I think that there is some correct uh, underlying feelings about saving the bees, right? I I am a bee conservation biologist. A lot of my work is about educating people about bees. Uh, So 20 years ago when I first started studying bees, we would be down in southern Utah hiking on a a popular hiking trail with our bee nets and catching bees. And at that time, people would always ask us about being stung. You know, how often do you guys get stung? And it was like, okay, this is another annoying question, but we would tell them, you know, some anecdotal thing. Um, fast forward to five years ago, people had a different kind of awareness of bees. There was news stories about bees disappearing. And so now when we do research and we're hiking on a popular trail with our nets, people still ask about getting stung, but they also will ask, well, how are the bees doing? So I saw this shift kind of culturally Mm -hmm. from bees are scary or bees make honey. That's the kind of the two things people used to think to, oh, bees are in danger of some sort. And so there's this growing movement in society to save the bees, but without, with, there's very limited knowledge about what that means. Um, most people think of honeybees. If you look at the Honey Nut Cheerios box, you see a bee, uh, that is a honeybee. But in North America, there are 4,000 different kinds of bees. One of those is the honeybee, and it's not from North America. And so when we think of stinging and honey, 
we're mostly thinking about that one of 4,000. Or worldwide, there's about eight honeybee species out of 20,000 bee species. So honeybees are a very small fraction of what bees actually are. But because we have kind of grown up around, as a culture, grown up around this idea of honey and bees being interconnected, uh, our focus on saving the bees easily turns to the honeybee. Yeah. Can I give an analogy about of course. honeybees and saving things? So, so honeybees are not a wild animal, right? I think of them as livestock in a way. And if if there are beekeepers out there listening, uh, stick with me for a second. <laughs> you know, I like livestock too. Um, a wise professor out of England once said, uh, let's see, how did he say it? He said, buying honeybees to save bees is like buying chickens to save birds. And so I have chickens in my yard. I have mm-hmm. a chicken coop. We have eight chickens and I love them, right? They, have, they give us eggs and it's, it's pretty great. But if I wanted to see more finches in my yard or more hummingbirds in my yard, buying chickens or increasing my flock is not going to help that. And if I buy too many chickens in my yard, I will see less hummingbirds and less quail and you know the chickens are going to kind of take over. Yeah. And that's the same thing with honeybees. So honeybees in one of those hive boxes, there's about 50,000 individual bees, a lot of bees in there. And so when we bring 50,000 bees and put them in our backyard, we have to make sure there's food for 50,000 bees because there are already a lot of native bees that live in our yard, but we might not recognize them because most native bees don't look like honeybees. Mm -hmm. They're smaller usually. They're not orange and, and striped. You know, a lot of them are just small little black bees that we might think of as flies. But so the focus on saving the bees if we just focus on honeybees, it would be like, hey, let's let's protect endangered birds, but let's just focus on the chicken. Yeah. Uh, so that's 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 where I think you're right. The focus has been misguided, and so a lot of my research and a lot of my work is to teach people there are other bees besides honeybees. So now getting into the more complex question, and you and I have both talked about this: Do the bees need saving? That is a very complex question. And let me go back to birds to answer that. So if I had a t-shirt that said, save the birds, uh, it, it's, a good, it's a good thought, right? Um, hopefully, somebody that is thinking about it, they might think, which birds does he mean? You know, mm-hmm. Do we want to save, are we trying to save the seagulls? Is that our focus? Uh, are we saving the great blue heron? Like, what are we doing? What does it mean, save the birds? Or if I said, birds are endangered, you might think, are, like, are all birds endangered? Because I see a lot of birds in my yard. And that's, that's the complexity about saving the bees. Uh, there are some bees, some wild bees, that have their, their population numbers have dramatically dropped. Uh, some bumblebees, for example, 50 years ago, uh, they used to live, you know, all of this one species used to live all across the Western United States. Now it lives in one-tenth the area, or it can be found in one-tenth the area where it used to be found. Oh, wow. So some bees are dramatically... Uh, their ranges are declining or their population numbers are declining. So do those bees bees need to be saved? Well, there is definitely something going on that we should try to be aware of. But other bees are just fine or expanding their ranges. So so to say should bees be saved, I guess the answer is yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's a a very complex question. But even the ones that are doing well, I don't think that they are in a position that we can just say, let's ignore those ones, mm-hmm. right? That we're, we do a lot of changes to our environment as we, we take a former desert and build houses on it. And even the bees that are doing well, that is going to affect them. Yes. So there are changes we can make. Though. Yeah. So the bees aren't in danger per se, but they do require more attention than what we've given them in the past and currently as well, yes. is what you're saying. Exactly. And I love that. And leads me on to my next question, why bees? Kind of like, you know, why do you study bees? But why are bees so important? Like you said, when, when people think about bees, they think, oh, honey. And that's literally it. Yeah. When you were explaining to me all the different bees that we have, my mind was blown because I had no idea. And we we're never taught about these things in, in school. And unless you're someone who goes and studies about yeah. bees, you would never know. So why bees? That is a good question. And, you know, I ask this to elementary schools when I go to the elementary school just to see what the kids think about when I ask, say, you know, what do you, think, what do you know about bees? And uh, we, most people are kind of familiar with this idea of pollination. Mm-hmm. So uh, a large portion of the, the foods that we eat, most of the fruits and vegetables, uh, not all of them, but most of them, 
require pollination in order to, to produce seeds. And so there are lots of animals that pollinate. There are some plants that are pollinated by birds and some by moths, but bees, and I'm somewhat biased, but bees are the best pollinators out there. So they're the best pollinators because they are one of the few animals that is active, actively gathering pollen. So bees actually take the pollen home to feed to their babies. That's why bees are visiting the flower. But because they are actively gathering this pollen, when a bird isn't necessarily, or a moth isn't necessarily, uh, the bees will transfer more pollen between flowers, and that, that pollinates these flowers, enables the flowers to produce seeds. So uh, some, some people estimate that every third bite of food we take bees are responsible for. Now that's kind of a, a weird statistic because it depends on what your diet is. Yeah. Um, if you eat only rice, rice does not need bees <laughs> no. to, to, to be pollinated, you know? But even ice cream, uh, ice cream, I like to say we need to thank bees for ice cream. And you might think, okay, ice cream comes from cows. Cows are not pollinated by bees. Um, but many cows, especially dairy cows, are fed alfalfa, mm -hmm. very nutritious for them. Uh, alfalfa, to produce seeds uh, requires bees as pollinators. And in fact, a lot of studies show that the wild bees are better at pollinating alfalfa than honeybees are. But so when we're eating our ice cream with our strawberries on it and our chocolate sauce, pollinators are responsible for almost all of that. Uh, and bees are one of the best pollinators. So if we like good food, we should care about bees and pollination. I love that. And not only are they really good at pollinating the food we eat, but they're also really good at pollinating the oils that all of us love and are very familiar with. Uh, and I guess more specifically is lavender, because a lot of people have seen bees in lavender. But that's what we think, and it's possible that there could be more. And this leads me to my point of why Dr. Wilson is actually here, because we are partnering with him and Utah State University on a discovery of what bees actually are doing for our crops, you know, whether it be the quantity that we receive in oil or if they help, you know, clean the lavender and keep them away from other bugs or something like that. This is going to be a massive discovery because we honestly know so little. And the way that this got brought up is I remember years and years and years back when there was a crisis with lavender back in France, my dad asked, well, where are the bees at? You know, where, where do they lie with this? Are they doing well? Are they thriving? And so, you know, thinking about it, and after, you know, our, our marketing director, Colby, watched your TED Talk, he said, you know what? Maybe we need to go back and really focus on what Gary was trying to say many, many years ago and actually see, like, what are the bees doing? What are they doing? And so this is going to lead into, like I said, an amazing discovery. And, and if you'd like to share a little bit on that and, and what you find interesting in all of this, I'd, I'd love oh, for totally. you to share for everyone else. Yeah. So one of the things I often provide for people is a list of plants that they can plant in their yard uh, to help bees because bees need plants. Uh, on almost all those lists that I provide that other people provide online, lavender is always on there. It's in the top 10 plants for bees. And, and I have lavender in my yard and bees visit it. But what was interesting is when we first started talking, um, I tried to do some, some searches in, through the published scientific literature to see what kinds of bees visit lavender. I mean, everyone suggests it as a, as a good plant for bees, mm -hmm. but there wasn't a list out there. Um, so as far as I know, nobody has really compiled a list of bees that visit lavender, even though it's always recommended as a, a plant that's good for bees. And so it's interesting because I, living in Utah for most of my life, I have driven down um, down through Utah County and driven past the lavender farms down in the, the south end of the valley many times and thought, you know, that's probably a really interesting place to look at bees. <laughs> and so I had been thinking this for probably the last 10 years. And so then when you guys contacted me, I thought, oh, what a, what a perfect opportunity. We're both interested in the same idea. And so we want to, I mean, I guess the first question we want to ask is, what bees are visiting the lavender yeah. at, 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 at your farms? Um, and it kind of there's two, two avenues in this question or two directions that we can go in this question is one is how are the farms benefiting the bees, right? There's a lot of, of, of resources that you are providing that the bees can benefit from as far as food and, and things like that. But then the secondary question is how are the, the interact, how is the interaction between the bees and the lavender uh, affecting the crop, especially the oils, right? Yes. 
And so that's another question that, that we will be addressing eventually is which bees visit it? And then how does that visitation uh, influence the, the lavender um, or influence the, the, the essential oil yeah. production in that lavender? How does it affect the circle of life with oil production? Exactly. And that's the thing. We're starting with lavender because we've only seen bees with lavender. Sometimes I've seen some in like our goldenrod mm-hmm. and our peppermint, but most commonly I see them in the lavender fields. And so that's why we want to start with lavender. But, you know, once we have an understanding of if they do something with lavender and partake in that, then we can go and explore all the other plants as well. And what I think is going to be extremely interesting as well is because the chemistry and composition of, you know, lavender here in Utah Mm -hmm. compared to France is slightly different. And so, you know, you and I were both talking about how it might be different also because of the bees as well that are there in France, that are native to France as well. And so this is just one of those, it's the amazing part about the scientific theory is simply just asking a question and seeing what's there. Exactly. And so I'm super excited about that. And I love that you're excited about it as well. And I think one thing that'd be nice to share is the uh, next steps that we're going to take to kind of start this up and what data we're trying to gather specifically. No, that's a a good, a good thought. Um, and you just mentioned, so lavender is native to, to France and that, that Mediterranean region around there. And honeybees are also native to, to Europe and Asia. Um, lavender is not native to Utah, but it grows well here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so there's a whole different community of bees at the, two, at the two areas. And so one of our questions is, how does that bee community that's visiting lavender differ between the farms in France and the farms here in Utah? Um, which will be interesting because there's bound to be differences. Yes. But then, how do those differences have what? What interplay is there between the, you know the oils that are coming from the two areas? And so, this year is very much an exploratory year. Uh, we really don't know anything about the bees on in either of these areas. And so, the plan is is this summer. Um, my wife and I will be visiting these these farms to collect bees, and you're going to be joining us yep. in some of these expeditions uh, to collect bees throughout the season, uh, hopefully near the, the early parts of when the lavender's first blooming all the way through harvest, and then... Um, and potentially later into the fall in some of the in some of the areas where it's available to see how the bee communities... Uh, what the bee community is on the two areas. Um, Part of that, before we can take the next steps of asking additional questions, is we have to have some baseline data. And so that's fun. What's, it's fun about what science is, is because it's like discovery. Uh, we, are, we are asking questions that we don't know the answers to. And then once we find those answers, we think, okay, what's the next question we can ask? And so this year, we really are kind of in a fact-finding mission to say, what is there? And then once we know that, we can say, okay, what improvements need to be made at these in these different areas? Do we need to provide new nesting spots for them? Or what other flowers might we be able to, to plant in the, the edges of the farm that will increase the diversity of bees? Yeah, and it also raises a question too, as far as like data and analytics go, is if we know what role the bees play, and it could be roles as well, we can say, well, this year, you know, they didn't provide as much, you know, X, Y, Z, or whatever it may be. So, you know, our quantity, our amount may not be as high as this year. And that's going to be amazing because I don't think there's any other industry in the world that has that data or has, you know, that science and can determine those kind of things from that. Yeah. And so in a way, this is going to be industry leading as well, which is just what we're really good at. Well, and what I was really impressed with throughout this process is is the way that you guys here at Young Living have made an effort to to ask the right questions and to to uh, take you know correct steps into learning about the bees. I mean, we have talked several times yes. about about how you guys realize that we do need to understand what's here before we can do new things. There's there's so many people out there as we started this conversation with that want to save the bees, and so they they take kind of some superficial steps to save the bees. Um, but that's not what I see you guys doing. You're saying we want to save the bees, but we want to really know what that means yes. and and make real efforts to to make a real change. So the as you said, the industry leading, it's 
it's applying to lots of aspects of what you guys are doing. And with this saving the bees or getting to know the bees uh, is pretty impressive. So we've really gone deep into all of this. And I'm sure people are asking the question, you know, well, how can I help? So let's go back a little bit. And you were talking a little bit, you know, that some people can plant certain plants to bring more native bees and just bees in general to their place. But as far as, you know, what we're talking about with, with saving the bees and just bringing attention to the subject, as someone who wants to help, what can they do? That's a great question. And so uh, there's, there's this desire. Of how, can I, how can me as an individual person, how can I help the bees? You know, most of us can't convert our, our yard into a, a, a lavender field, for example. <laughs> It'd be awesome. Um, but most of us can't do that. And so with this desire... There's a lot of people that will give opinions online. Mm -hmm. um, most of those opinions are based on honeybees, uh, which I understand, and we've talked about that. But really, the step one into saving the bees the correct way, I tell people is you need to get to know the bees, right? Uh, recognize that honeybees are not the poster child, so to speak, for other bees. In fact, they're really, really different than most other bees, not only how they look, but how they act and how they behave and what their needs are. So once we recognize and get to know these other bees and then recognize and get to know some of the needs of these other bees, we can do pretty simple steps in our yards um, without maybe even making huge changes that can benefit the bees. Um, one of those steps is to plant some flowers. Um, not all flowers are good for bees. Uh, bees don't visit roses, for example. Uh, and you can still have roses in your yard, and that's totally fine. But there are various plants that bees are more attracted to, lavender being one of those. Mm -hmm. um, I often suggest to people to plant some native flowers. The, the bees that, that have lived in Utah for millions of years have lived with these flowers that have lived in Utah for millions of years. And so they have kind of a tight relationship with those flowers. So native flowers are good, but it's important to provide some kind of a flower resource from the early spring to the late fall. Um, so if we're, when we're planting our flower garden, we always we want flowers that are blooming all summer. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want a dead flower garden in July. Uh, and so our desires of beautiful flower gardens kind of mimic the bees' desires of food all year long. Yeah. So plant flowers is one step. And then the next step is uh, potentially a little bit more complicated, but not really. It's providing habitat for bees. One thing we haven't talked about is where bees live and and kind of what they do. So I've, I've said multiple times they're not like honeybees. Um, so we know honeybees, they live in a hive. There's a queen and thousands of workers and they make honey. No other bees are like that. Most bees are solitary, and most bees, like 80% of them, are solitary, and they nest in a hole in the ground that they dig. So there's no queen, there's no workers, there's no hive, none of them make honey, but they, they work really hard, and they're really efficient pollinators. So if we can leave some dirt in our yard, they like bare patches of dirt, and they dig their nest in that dirt. So landscaping that way can be tricky. If you like your flower garden to look very manicured and pretty, you often don't want just a patch of dirt <laughs> in the middle. In the middle of it. Yeah. Uh, what my my wife has actually uh, kind of came up with this idea is in our yard this last year we put these metal rings, kind of like the rings you would surround trees um, with. Oh yeah. We put a metal ring in our flower garden, surrounded it with mulch, but left just bare dirt inside that metal ring. Oh, so it's visually pleasing and and hidden in a way, but also protective as well. Exactly. So. And so we have different sizes of metal rings, and we have one square one for the the contrast between the round and the square. And so I like how it looks. And this spring, hopefully we'll see if the bees also like it. Yeah. But so p leaving some dirt uh, is good for bees. Sometimes if that means it's in the corner of your backyard, that's that's a good way to do it. If you can't, if you can't do it in your flower garden. Um, there's also ways you can provide for the, the other bees that don't nest in the ground. You can make these things I call bee hotels. <laughs> so a lot of bees in nature will find a, a dead a dead tree or something like that where beetles have burrowed into it. So there's little holes in the dead tree. Uh, these wild bees will kind of take over that abandoned beetle burrow and make it their own. Some of them use leaves to kind of make wallpaper out of it and they, they make their nest in there. What happens is when we, when we build neighborhoods where it used to be more wild land, we don't leave dead trees around in the neighborhood or dead stumps around in the neighborhood. So these 
nesting areas for these cavity nesting bees are limited. But so we can kind of um, make up for that by providing these bee hotels in some ways. And they, there's lots of instructions online, but basically you're providing uh, empty hollow twigs for the bees to nest okay. in. And uh, so that's providing food for them and then providing nesting habitat. And so whatever scale we want to do that in our yard can be beneficial. If you just plant one flower, that can benefit lots of bees. If you want to plant 10 flowers, that's even better. Wow, that's great. So when people hear the bzzz sound, they automatically assume it's a bee. And, you know, the, the they always there are some people that are obviously allergic to bees and don't like bees and have been stung by bees. Um, and you and I kind of talked about this off camera a while back is people don't necessarily hate bees. It's the wasps that they hate. So let's talk a little bit about that for people that don't like bees, I guess you can say. No, exactly. People always say, I, oh, you study bees? I hate bees. And I say that to them. You, you probably hate wasps. It's, it's not the bees that you hate. So let's talk about bio, biology for a second. Um, biologically, bees are they're herbivores. They eat pollen and nectar. Like that's their food source. The mm -hmm. pollen is the protein. The nectar is the energy drink because it's mostly just sugar yeah. and water. So bees are herbivores. Wasps are bees cousins and they are carnivores. They are the, the predators of the insect world. Um, some of them, and they, they hunt mostly other insects. But so as meat eaters, they have a more of a aggressive disposition maybe, and you probably experienced some of that aggression. I think everybody has. Yes, unfortunately, right? When we're at our backyard barbecue and we have our hamburger on our plate and there's something yellow and black buzzing around the hamburger, it's probably not a bee because the bee doesn't care about your hamburger. But the wasp can smell the meat in your hamburger and it, it wants to feed that to its babies. And if you're, if you're brave or kind of a bug geek like myself, you might leave that wasp alone and see what it does to your hamburger, it will carve a little piece of the hamburger out and fly that home to feed its babies. I've never wanted to see if that would happen. <laughs> so I, I can't say I have, but that is interesting. <laughs> and so one problem is then it tells all of its sisters, hey, I found a hamburger and then you'll have more wasps at your barbecue. But they are wasps. And so they are slightly more aggressive. They don't come there to sting you, um, but they, they have a, a family to feed and they will make some effort to protect their food source and their, their nest. Um, people often ask, well, what about yellow jackets? And so yellow jackets, are, they're a kind of wasp. They're a social wasp that lives in a big colony, kind of like a honeybee. And they are pretty aggressive because they have hundreds of babies in that hive, often underground. And so when you accidentally bump into that hive or get too close to that entrance of the hive, several of those worker yellow jackets will come out and sting you. And so people ask me, well, what good are wasps, right? And the, the answer is they are natural pest control. Uh, a lot of the, the pest insects in our gardens, caterpillars and aphids and other things like that, they're a, a food source for wasps. And so the wasps are often in your garden flying around hunting. And so, so wasps are not bad in your yard, but yet they are aggressive. So even as an entomologist, I get rid of those wasp nests that I see under the eaves of my house. Okay. Because I don't want to get stung either. That's fair. So they're not bad, but they're also not necessarily good. They're kind of like right there on the on the gray area scale, that gray line. We, we can find a happy medium if we if we do it right. Yeah. And since we've talked so much about bees, and you know, like I said, my mind has exploded yet once <laughs> again with all this knowledge about bees. I think now is a good time to debunk some common bee buzz myths. Let's do it. The most common one, obviously, do bees really get that one sting? You know, that's what people always ask. It is true for the honeybee. A honeybee will sting you once and die. All the other 20,000 bee species can sting you multiple times. All right. So another myth, and this is more current because we've recently introduced 5G with our cell phones, and I read somewhere online that 5G is killing the bees. So this myth has roots all the way back to when we first started with cell phones. People were saying cell phones in general are causing bees to, to die or to disappear. Uh, there is no scientific evidence that that is the case either for the 3G or the 4G or the 5G now. It's just for some reason keeps coming up again. Interesting. So this is kind of going to be a two-parter. We, we talked about, you know, bringing bees more to your backyard. But what if we see like a massive swarm of bees come into our backyard? Is there, you know, somebody we can call like Ghostbusters if we see ghosts and stuff like that? Is there a, is there a, a 
bee buster, I guess? Or? <laughs> you know, there kind of is. So, but we should, we should take a step back because when you see this big swarm of bees, it almost looks like a cloud of bees coming in. Sometimes you see pictures on the internet, yeah. that, like all over the playground equipment or something. Those are honeybees. Other bees don't swarm. What happens is when a honeybee's hive that it's living in gets too small for how, how big the, the family is getting, they take half the family and a new queen and find another spot. So that swarm is the scouting mission. They are swarming around the queen to protect her to find a new spot. They're not aggressive during the swarm. Um, so you don't need to be worried about that. And there are lots of local beekeepers that I'm sure would be happy to come in and take that swarm because they can actually kind of scrape the swarm of bees into a box and now they have a, a, a beehive. That's uh, great to hear. Populated. I have seen a lot of videos that once again blow my mind of, of there's one specific uh, beekeeper gal and I can't remember her username, but she literally goes and collects bees from like barbecues and all sorts of other stuff. And she does it without, you know, one of those safety suits and stuff. Yeah. And she's like, they're actually very docile. They're very calm. They're just trying to find a home and we're trying to help them, you know, relocate to a better home for them. That's not in your backyard. And yeah. that could possibly be dangerous for children that are, you know, allergic or anybody like that. So that's great. Talking about bees and also more recent, uh, in the last years, we had this whole issue with killer bees coming to America. What's all behind that? Yeah, so a lot of that is just um, is just people being ex more scared than they need to be, okay. I think. So a killer bee or a, a quote killer bee uh, is actually a kind of honeybee. And so we have various varieties of honeybees uh, um, from Europe and Asia. There's another variety that lives in Africa. Uh, not a different species, just another regional variety. Um, and... A scientist in Brazil 30 years ago, 40 years ago, decided to, to kind of mix some of these varieties together. He was he was hoping to make maybe the uh, the golden doodle of the bee world, trying mm. to mix mix some of these characteristics to get uh, a, a really hardworking, effective bee. And he did get a hardworking, effective bee, but the 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 intermixing he did made a, a pretty aggressive bee. And so as they spread north from Brazil, through the tropics, through Mexico, and now in the warmer parts of North America, of, of the United States, they, they got the name killer bee because they're more aggressive in nature. They're not more toxic than honeybees. Uh, they just have a, a, a little bit meaner disposition. If you or I went to a, a normal beehive and approached the entrance of that beehive, those bees would want to protect their hive and they would send out some, some worker bees to sting us. Uh, the, the killer bee variety does the same thing. They just send out a, a, a much larger regiment of workers to sting you. And so there are lots of beekeepers in Southern California and Arizona that, that work well with these killer bees, so to speak. So I think we need to find a new name for them because they're not really killers. They're just a little bit meaner. Once again, people just weren't quite educated well enough or properly on these bees as well. So that's interesting. Yeah. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much once again for coming on and sharing your vast knowledge and, and passion about bees and what you do. And I'm super excited for all, all the adventures that we're going to be having, you know, with this bee mission, I guess you can say. And um, is there a place that people can go to learn more about bees if they want to? Uh, yeah. So I maintain, me and, and some of my colleagues maintain various social media sites. If you look up the bees in your backyard on uh, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, that's where we're at. Or our website, beesinyourbackyard.com. It's a lot of information about these wild bees. And then if you'd like to share really quickly your uh, TED Talk that you did on bees. Yeah, so I gave a TED Talk several years ago about bees. The title is Save the Bees. Wait, was that a bee? And so if you want to learn a little bit more about what we've been talking about, that's a good source also. Awesome. I love that. And for everything that you just heard about, and if you'd like to know more, the links for all of these platforms and videos will be down below in the description on this YouTube video. So for those of you on Spotify, sorry, you'll have to come on over and watch it one more time. <laughs> but Dr. Wilson, once again, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks. And thank you all for tuning into this episode of the YL Drop. Remember, you can listen on iTunes, Spotify, on YouTube, and our newly refurbished website at www.youngliving.com. Don't forget to oil up Young Living family. This is Jacob Young, dropping out. Take care. Take care.